weren't here last night, so. In AA, they talk about the root of the problem. And, and they bring it to the point of that it's obsession with self. That's the root of the problem. We're extremely concerned with who we think we are. And this is like actually the cause of the irritability, restlessness, and discontentment. There's a fact that, in a sense, by being obsessed with what you're not, it's the way you deny what you are. So the spiritual malady to me is a, is a, a forgetfulness. You forget your nature, which is of spirit. And then you're constantly remembering your nature as a body. Yeah. And that's how, by actively remembering this as being me, you, act, you basically deny that as being you. Yeah. And so what occurs is, we start from this premise, and this, the body is trying to set off an alarm. It's telling us something's wrong, this irritability, restlessness, and discontentment. But what answers that bell is the problem. Because the, the selfing... It's an act of mind. There's no self. It's not a noun. It's the mind self, selfing. It's a verb, yes? But it, the verb, if you're listening to it, it, be, it creates a sense of being a noun, which is Paul, as this. Paul with his body and his brain and his, history and a past and a future and constant old ideas and character effects and everything like that. So the verbing, the selfing, creates an illusion of being a noun. So, people say the obsession with self is the root of the problem. What I'm going to offer tonight is I don't believe that to be the case. I believe it's identification as self, which is different. Because I, and it's not like we were tattooed with an identification as self. It's a verb the mind's doing all day. Yeah, That thing that you're struggling with that we call obsession, that narrative up there, that constant yakking and all like this, when you walk in a room... Basically, you, you're really just attending to the thoughts you had about walking in the room. You don't really experience walking in the room. When you come in here, your mind's going, did anyone notice me coming in? Are my pants too short? Oh, who's is that person who I owe an amends to in the room? And So, basically, you're unconscious of the actual walking in the room, and you're totally aware of the thoughts about it. That's the obsession with self. The obsession with self is very difficult to deal with. You can get some relief from it, but it basically never seems to get extinguished. And why I believe that to be the case is because it's not the cause. It's not the cause of the dilemma. It's an effect. So every time you deal with an effect, without dealing with the cause, you're going to have to deal with more of the effect. Because the cause is going to keep producing the effect it's producing. Most of us have been in a constant experience of the effect, and we're trying to deal with it as a cause. We're trying to deal with the obsession with self as the cause, and we're having a difficult time, no one seems to get total, absolute re relief from it. We don't even get that really long-lasting relief. We tend to have maybe a moment there, a moment here, maybe we go on a, to a convention or a retreat and we get some relief, but as soon as we go back to work or go back to the family, the obsessing seems to come on again. Yeah? So we have to constantly keep applying a solution to the problem, because I believe because it's an effect. So it, no matter how much you put a solution on the effect, the cause is still going to produce it. Yeah. So when I, because I practiced years of AA from the point of view that obsession was the problem, I didn't realize that the real problem was I was identified as what I was calling self. So self was trying to get out of self all the time. And that's an impossibility. So when it was finally corrected by the relief I have gotten over the years, it verifies the tree, so to speak. What Jesus supposedly has said, I don't know what he said, but he said, a good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. Yeah? And a bad tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Well, I've been, I've been having a long years of harvesting good fruit. So I've assumed or intimated to me that I must have hit the right tree yeah? with this idea of being identified as self. Because as soon as I entertained I wasn't that, I lost interest in the obsessiveness of the thoughts. Seriously, I used the little example last night, but it's it's just like a dirt shit way of looking at it. It's beautiful for me. I may have some keen interest in some lady that's in the other room here, so I want to hear what she has to say because it has a big, it has a lot of meaning in my life. I've got an idea I'm going to marry and conceive my first child with her. I never even talked to her yet, but my head is going off. Yeah, 
And so there she's in the other room, and so I'm keen on hearing what she has to say to see if I have a chance, you know. Of course, I'm self-centered. I'm, I'm sure she's speaking about me over there. There's like eight other billion people she could be speaking about, but no. So I'm listening intently, and I, sh- I have this thing that's happening, which is what's happening, but I'm not really attending to it because that's really important to me. And I know better, but I can't seem to break the habit. I'm sitting there listening, listening, listening. You know, hopefully she says something. People are going, Paul, Paul, come on, be here where you are. And I go, yeah, 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 but I can't seem to do it. Then I finally hear a talk, and she's talking about Mac. I lose interest immediately. Yeah? I don't have to take three months of workshops to stop listening through a wall to hear another person's conversation. As soon as I know it's not about me, I've lost interest in it. That's exactly what happens when you start entertaining you're not the self. When you start entertaining you're not the self, you lose interest in all the obsession about the self, which is all the thoughts that you're having all day about you. You lose interest in them. The reason why there are, the thought doesn't have the ability to cause an obsession. You're believing it is what's the obsession. The bonding agent isn't a thought. I and you can have the same thought, but if you believe one thought is about you, you'll have no immunity to it. If you recognize the same thought as mine, you'll have an immunity to my thought. But you won't have an immunity to your thought. Someone can come over and share about their thoughts, and you're like Solomon. You can give the greatest wisdom of all time about their thoughts. Hey, that's a crazy idea you're thinking. Have you run this by anybody? You should definitely not a good move, you know. Blah, blah, blah. But you'll be having the same thoughts, thinking it's an incredible idea. What's the difference? The my of it. The thought is not the bonding agent. You're not obsessed about the thoughts. You're obsessed because they're yours, and they're about you. Seriously. If you had someone else's thoughts pumped in with their voice, you'd be bored of them in about a minute. Their daily narrative, but you've been listening to the same thing for 40 freaking years. It's like we have an antenna and it's stuck on K Paul. It's just picking up K Paul all day, yes? K Paul with lots of commercials about Paul, yes? Bum, 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 bum. No public announcements. Just da, 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 da. And it seems too hard to break it. Why? Because you think it's about you. I'm serious. I am serious. I've watched it. I've looked at it in my own life and other people's lives. A thought is just a thought until it becomes your thought. A thought is just a thought until it becomes about you. Then it becomes a story. And what happens, because it's about you, you find interest in the story. When someone else comes to your house and they run their story to you, you're bored in five minutes, aren't you? i got to do the laundry. Will you shut the fuck up? I'm sick and tired of hearing about you. But you've been hearing about you for 50 years and you still seem interested. <laughs> if you, just like it's boring to hear theirs, it's actually quite boring to hear this when you realize it's not about you. I swear to God. And what happens is, when you're not relying on the thoughts to know who you are and what's going on, that is the true surrender because that is the reliance on self. How the hell do you rely on self? You listen to the thoughts that are about it all day. That's what reliance on self is to me. I listen to K-Paul all day. Yeah? When I'm relying on something greater than self, that's like what they talk about in AA. It represents to me that thing of pause. Yeah? I'm in that pause. I'm in contact. Something has arisen. I see it because I'm awake. Yeah? Then I also see the self's reaction to it, which it claims it. Oh, this is about me. And then that me has tons of storylines that get downloaded. That pause is the freedom and the peace. Yeah? The conscious contact, something arises, I'm aware of it. The selfing kicks in, I realize it's not about me, and I don't insert my power to it, and it dies down. And what I'm left with is what's happening. I'm left with being conscious, I'm left with being awake, and that starts becoming what determines my life, not the thoughts, yes? Because obviously, following this thing has produced all the destinations you didn't want to go to. It's a faulty system. In AA, it says it very clearly in the fear inventory. It says, why is it that you have so much fear right now? And thank God he knows us. He doesn't let us answer. You know? He could have left about 50 pages blank and let us tell the story of why, why we have so much fear. He says, no, isn't it because self-reliance has failed us? 
So obviously, self-reliance is a failed system. How do you rely on self? Check it out. How do you? By listening to the thoughts that are about self and are based in self. The thoughts we're experiencing most of the time, that's why when we go to an AA meeting, why do you believe, why do you think you identify with people? Because they've been taken over by the same thing you've been taken over by. Alcoholism. It's like a parasite. And we're like 50 hosts here, all different, but the same parasite has taken us over. So the thoughts that I think are mine, you think are yours. And they're alcoholic thoughts. The feelings that you have about life that you think are yours and terminally unique, I'm having the same ones. And the reactions to life that you think were so heinous that you never want to tell another person, no one ever did what I did, you've done the same basic thing. Why? Because you've been taken over by the same thing that I was taken over by, alcoholism. It doesn't have an infinite amount of characteristics or traits. AA, the AA book and the 70 years of literature and meetings, we have pretty much defined the characteristics of the parasite called alcoholism, so that someone who suffers from it could recognize it, yes? But the one thing I believe we missed, which is its greatest strategy, because the parasite of alcoholism is host- it's a hostile parasite, isn't it? When it takes you over, it's not nice to the host. Yeah. <laughs> it sort of runs you ragged. Shit happens, big time. It's like... Whatever energy you have, it runs it out, man. You know, that's what we call, we go on a run. But the word run is so funny because if you've ever been on one, you're not running for long, are you? You're walking with a limp in a couple of weeks. Yeah? Then you're crawling in a few more weeks later. Then you're dragged back to what? Incomprehensible demoralization. Yeah? The characteristics have been noted. But the one I feel we've missed is the real key of it all which is I being identified as it. Because how could this parasite keep taking over the host? How could the host welcome it back in? How could the host allow it to have carte blanche access into all aspects of supposedly the host's life? It must have an incredible strategy. And it's sort of like the fish that live near the shark, yeah? the big great white. Those fish have a lot of security. Because no other fish are going to try to eat them. They're getting all the crumbs after the shark eats. And they got it pretty well made. But they're, they're still stingy and, and selfish. They want to even have it better. They still have self-centered fear. What's going to happen if the shark finally figures us out? So they, they say, all right, if we can convince the shark that it needs us, it'll never leave where we go. Well, the same thing in a way, this parasite of alcoholism convinces us that we're it. It presents an image through thought and memory and perception that we're a long-lasting, independent, separate entity, a body. Yes? A body. It becomes your primary identification, and spirit becomes relegated to something maybe you want to look into, or maybe you won't. But spirit is actually our real nature. But when this becomes the priority, spirit becomes an option you can entertain. I can become spiritual. I don't have to become spiritual because I'm this primarily first and last. Yes? This is called identification as the body. This is the Petri dish for the parasite. It locks you in, and now all the thoughts are from its system called self-centeredness. And we're just extreme, we're an extreme subdivision of self-centeredness. Everyone out there has self-centeredness. Everyone out there is suffering from the dis-ease of self-centeredness. We're just an extreme example. So when this, out, this parasite takes us over, it's like a super turbocharged parasite. And then it, it brushes our life with broad strokes. It pretty much goes crazy. And so it, in a sense, it's a great gift because it's easier to identify that you've been taken over by it because of its effects. They're so strong in our lives, it can grab your attention and wake you up out of the trance. Yes? How does, it able, how does it have so much opportunity to keep downloading all of its expressions into your life? You're identified as it. You cannot entertain it. You can be free of it because you believe you're it. So therefore, the best you can do is therapize it, maybe get it self-esteem so it gives you a little break, maybe try to get it a little more socialized so you don't flip out the, at the next barbecue you're you know, invited to. Maybe you'll be able to go on a date once and not flip out. So you, 
these are the great successes that self-centeredness gives us, you know. <laughs> but very rarely do you entertain you can be free of it because you think you're it. So the host has a perfect lock in you. You'll never, ever truly entertain being free of it. No matter how hostile it gets, no matter how heavy the expressions become, you'll still be calling its expressions through you yours. Because that's the act of being identified as it. In our book, it says very clearly to me, I read it this way, on page 64, it says, being convinced that self Manifested in various ways. So manifested means to appears. So self appears in various ways. Ha- where? In your life. Yeah? So self appears or manifests in various ways is what has defeated us. So he's making a very, very important statement. Self defeated us. So he's separating the two. Since I've been sober, after I've investigated, I truly believe how self actually defeated me was I was identified as it. Because if you sit here in this room and there's 40 or 50 people and you ask, all right, what self-defeated you? Every one of us would have the same answer. My self. So self cannot truly defeat us, but my self can. That's trippy, isn't it? Self can defeat us, but my self can. So you have to see your role in it. Because the energy that's actually fueling your defeat has been freely given to you to the parasite that's defeating you because you're identified as it. So it says, all right, self manifested in various ways is what has defeated us. Are you convinced of that? Do you believe with certainty with that? Yeah, I do. All right, if you are, we're now going to look at some of its common manifestations in our life. Yeah. Okay, what are they? The next paragraph, resentment. Then fear and the harm does to others. We look at our sexual behavior because we usually do a lot of harm in the pursuit of sex. So we look at that to see harms done to others. So the way I read it is that we're actually doing an inventory on self's expressions into our life. If you hear it, self manifested in various ways is what has defeated us. Yeah, I'm convinced of that. We are now going to look at it, the self's common manifestations in my life, which are resentments, fears, and harming other people. So to me, it sort of sounds like what he's saying in this thing, or at least is how I read it, yeah, is that self, that resentment and fear and harming other people are the expressions of self that are manifesting in my life. How does it, how, how does it have such carte blanche access into my life? I'm identified as it. <laughs> it's that freaking simple. I'm identified as a self. And self is downloading or expressing itself through me into life. And those are expressions. So if you want to use the old thing with Jesus, the fruit of that tree are resentments, fears, harming other people. And those are the grosser ones. There's a whole list of them. Just go you to your dictionary and look up the word self. And then you'll see about self, hyphen, and 80 other statements. And if you probably, if you do a little tab, you know, calculating, you'll see I think about 65 of them are negative and 15 are good. That's what you're against. The parasite in my head was simply like this. When something was going really good, I got worried very quickly. Yeah? If, I, if what I'd been pining away for for years finally showed up, I shat my pants. I immediately <laughs> thought, I don't deserve this, and sabotaged it. Yeah? I was living in this idea, well, when that finally comes, then I'll, then I'll, and then when it came, I flipped out. Yes, The same head, when I'm feeling bad, it says it's going to last forever. Do you want that to interpret your life for you? Because it is, if you're identified as it. Do you want that to interpret your life for you? When anything good comes along, you start thinking about it and screwing it up in 10, 15 minutes, maybe, if you're lucky. So, something bad, it's going to be a lifelong depression. Haven't that happened, really? You feel some weird thing, you don't even know what it is. Oh, it's coming. The thing I've been uh, worried of my whole life, I'm going to be bummed out forever. I'll never have another relationship. It always goes into never or always. <laughs> it's incredible. But never about happiness and joy and freedom. Happiness and joy and freedom are never held with ne- always and forever. It's always, nope, <laughs> nope. Now that you achieved it, you did something to fuck it up, there goes the happiness joint. So, 
This thing is expressing through us. It's using us. Truly. It's taken over the host. The host has forgotten it's the host, and it believes it's the parasite. That's why when you sit in an AA meeting, and everyone shares the thoughts and feelings and reactions, you identify. A normal person who doesn't have an extreme case of self-centeredness will be aghast at what we say. They say, I cannot believe you said that in public. You know? Totally, like, won't even get the jokes that we have here. But we're all laughing and everything. Why? Because I'm not identified with who you are. I am identified with what's taking you over. Because I'm under the same takeover. <laughs> you know, it sounds like I beat this thing, like, but because I do. Because I don't, if, I think if you go anywhere else without looking at this, what happens is this idea of self will be practicing your program. And when the results, which can be incredibly unbelievable, are received, they'll be neutered and diminished and partitioned and cut apart and separated. And what could have been a giant rush of water from that fourth dimension, that spiritual realm, will be a trickle that it controls. The spigot, it plays freaking God. So we go into the how and why of the program. And it says the how and why of it is you've got to quit playing God. Why? Because it doesn't work. So how the hell are you playing God? You're not. What you think you are is playing God. It's telling you how the day's going to be before you even get up out of bed, isn't it? It's telling you that it knows so much about you, how you were, how you're going to be, how you are, how they were, how they're going to be, how they are, how the world is. I'm never going to be loved. Or blah, 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 blah. It's pontificating constantly. It's like the, it, we take it to be like the Greek oracle, and it's wrong all the time. Yes? But we're relying on it completely, and it's a bogus system. That's why the irritability and restlessness and discontentment only is forgotten or disassociated from or patted down a little bit, but it's running your life. Because you're constantly in the mode of seeking relief from the unbearability, unbearable takeover that's going unnoticed. Because, seriously, this is what happens, in my view. It says, all right, perhaps there's a better way in AA. So, yeah, I'm for, I'm for that. My life seems to be a ruin, bankrupt can't enjoy anything. Oh, he says, okay, to stop trusting something finite, which is self. Why? Because it's unreliable. All I am is an expression of the principles my life has been resting on. My life was resting on the principle of self-reliance, and I, it's, I was a perfect expression of that. Now, I've been taken out of that, that pot with no soil, with lousy, air, with lousy light, with no water, and I've never bloomed, and now I've been put in a good pot supplied by AA in the community, with a lot of soil, with light and water, and now the thing that never bloomed is blooming like crazy. What happened? Did it change? What? Was it two different things? No. It was the same apparatus, but what was controlling it was expressing through it. One expresses life like an arid desert where you live in hope that someday something's going to save you. Here, it's a flourishing garden because you're in the moment and you're conscious. It's what you're relying on. That's what you are right now. You're just a, an expression of whatever it is that you're relying on. You can see the expressions. The greatest devotees of self are the ones that are worrying about nothing all day. They live in what's not happening. They go into what's not happening. They mine and harvest a crop of anxiety and resentments and nostalgia and hope and this and that. And then they download it into this moment. And then you have to be the farmer and cultivator of it in this moment. You've got to pick it all up. And then what's not happening is entertained. Because most people are in a mythical Friday. They're not even here tonight. Right now in this room, there's no physical response that should promote fear in you. The room is cool. It's not cold. No one's holding a gun, I don't think. You know? I may bore you to death, but I'm not going to, you know, shoot you. But if you're not here, if let's say you're in next Friday, and next Friday you're going to be fired, and you know next Friday your boyfriend or girlfriend is going to be sleeping with your best friend, or you have cancer next Friday, yeah? in that what's not happening, the body only, only mirrors what you believe is happening. So if you believe you have cancer next Friday, 
the body's going to be in anxiety now. It's going to be tight. The nerves are going to be frayed. Your mind's going to be racing. Your hands may be sweaty. And one of the biggest things is you won't be able to attend what's happening because you'll be captured by what's not happening. Yeah? So here we are living in what's not happening. Which cause, and the thing is, in what's not happening, anything can happen. Yeah? It has no, no parameters. It's not happening. <laughs> so you can make anything happen there. <laughs> yeah? You can make everything happen there. So in what's not happening, anything can happen. But thank God we have the antidote to what's not happening, which is what's happening. Okay? Now, what's happening only has one quality, which is it's happening. But that one quality is the one that what's not happening doesn't have. That trumps what's not happening. Because what's happening is happening. Yes? And why it's happening to you and me is because we're meeting it in consciousness. That's our spirit. So the conscious contact, just acknowledging the basic conscious contact you're in is relying on spirit. Because that is what is so. The head reacts to that conscious contact, which I call selfing, and then it tells you a story about what's missing and what's happening. Oh, this what's happening isn't as good as the last what's happening, that what isn't happening, or the future what's happening will be better than any happening that's happening, but that isn't happening. Yeah? And all of this selfing will blind you to the basic fact of your true nature, which is you're aware, you're conscious. You and I don't, I don't believe we have conscious contact, I believe we are the conscious contact. We're the consciousness that's in contact here. Through the interface of a body, but we're not the body. I had the direct hit of this when I was younger. I had this Uncle Fred that I really liked. Probably because every relative's party, he'd give me a couple of bucks behind his back. You know? He'd pay me off, basically. <laughs> and I was, so I really liked Uncle Fred. And then Uncle Fred died. And my mother took me to the funeral, and it was an open casket, and I was nine years old, I think, and she brought me past the casket, and I looked in to see Uncle Fred. And when I saw that body, I had a direct hit that that ain't Uncle Fred. The reason why I thought it was Uncle Fred all the while is because I was thinking I was this body. But when I saw the body without the animating principle, I had a direct hit, that ain't Uncle Fred. Exactly the same in you. You're the animating principle, or that consciousness, or that spirit. You're not the apparatus. We've taken ourselves to be Fords, you know? We drive like a Ford, we turn like a Ford, we smell like a Ford, but we keep thinking we're a special Ford. No, we're a Ford. And the beautiful news is you're not a Ford. That's the beauty. But first admit that you're a Ford, and then you realize you're not a Ford. You're that spirit that's looking out of your head. Like St. Francis says, what's looking is what you're looking for. What's looking is what you're looking for. I don't like the word looking because I like seeing better. Because I believe what we're doing here is looking. And to me, the way we look here is blinding us to seeing. The way we look is blinding us to natural seeing. So the first way we've been looking here, or trained to look, is self-centeredly, Right? I look at everything as how it pertains to me. I did not practice this. It was the way my thoughts were since I was a young kid. Yeah? I didn't have any other thoughts to compare. I can't see other people's thoughts. I took these to be, this is the way thinking is, but it was a contrived system called self-centeredness. So there's my head, constantly thinking, 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 and I see everything as it pertains to me. That's self-centeredness. That's what I truly suffer from. Yeah? So there I go. This thing started to happen. And I forgot my nature, because when I was between two and four of my golden years, yeah, when I was a young kid, because I was wide awake. When I was playing, I wasn't thinking, will I be playing next week? Because I didn't have a concept of next week yet. Yeah, I would be with the ants, and I mean I was with the ants. You know, I was totally into that ant world. And it was incredible, and there was no voice in my head saying, oh, this is incredible. There was no narrator. Yeah? There was no one yapping. It was just pure conscious contact. And it was wonderful and awe and all that stuff that we so wish we could experience again. But it's very difficult to experience it as a self. It's the absence of self that brings all that back. Yeah? 
So then I, there was that forgetfulness. So I grew into this other state called self-centeredness. And it took me over. And I have the conditioning of an extreme division of it called alcoholism. And that became the, the, the dominant expressor through my life. And I became forgotten to be a Catholic kid, Irish kid from Long Island, but I became a junkie and an addict, an alcoholic, and all the things that we become, seemingly. Yeah? And then suddenly I get sober, and I have a, 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 first of all, it was a rude awakening for a while, but then I had an awakening. I had that spiritual awakening we talked about. And the spiritual awakening gave me, an exper- gave me a sense of what I truly was. Yeah. What usually happens when self experience, let's say, if you ever have an epiphany, you know what an epiphany is? Yeah. If you know what an epiphany is, it, you, never, you can't make a reservation for it. Yeah? You don't call ahead and go, I'm going to have an epiphany and you know, put that Kenny G music in and the candles. There's, it sort of interrupts your little linear story of life. You know, something happens and you're really living unadorned as self. Yeah? But what happens with the self is amazing, this mental system, self-centeredness, is it will arise and go, I, meaning the self, just had this incredible spiritual experience, which just nuded the whole event, because it actually showed you your own nature, and now you're claiming it to be an experience you had. That's what it does all the freaking time. And then, now that it's an experience it had, it obviously entertains the option that it may never have it again. Or I have to go to the Himalayas to have it. Or I can't have it if I have kids and a wife. Or I can't have it because of this or that. Because it seems like there's something I have to do and, and have to get it. But in fact, it's what you are. It's not determined by your circumstances and situations. It's prior to your circumstances and situations. But we don't see it that way from self. So now we look at it from self and go, wow, I really want to have another one of those. Like you had anything to bring it about anyway. So now you start going to Himalayas or start reading books, and now you want to become spiritual, but as a self. Yeah? So now the self wants to become spiritual. So let's say it takes yoga, yeah, or it gets whites and some patchouli oil and beads, and it gives you that loving look, you know. I know something you don't, and I pity you that you don't know it. Yes. But I love you, yes. Okay. And you get into this thing, and so now the self is adapting itself to an identification as a spiritual self. Yes? That's not spirit. That revelation of the epiphany is what you are. No matter how you think you're looking, it's what's looking. No matter how much your head interprets what's looking to be you and a body, it's what's looking. It's what's looking when you're thinking you're doing a terrible thing. It's what's looking when you're at the retreat. It's what's looking when you're helping someone. It's what's looking when you're hurting somebody. Your true nature never changes. It's going to always be your true nature. It's always available at all times with no requirement necessary. But what happens with the self when you identify it as it? It plays God to your access to your own nature, to you. It tells you, you've got to do this and this and this and this, and then if you don't, you'll be disconnected. So let's say you learn to meditate, and every day you meditate and you feel better. Yeah? But then you miss one day. That day, you, you, ex- you feel that you're disconnected all day. You see? When you believe you connect, you can believe you can disconnect. You still play God. It's always based on what your head tells you. Yeah? It's telling me I'm closer to God because it's, I've been meditating. When I don't meditate that day, it says because you're not meditating, you're farther away. How can you be far away or close to what you are? Only if you believe what you're not. If you believe what you're not, it's one already. Because you're trying to... You're trying to attain a spiritual condition. You're trying to achieve one. You've missed the whole boat. You are one. You are a spiritual condition. It says, you know, the, the whole thing is contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition, that daily reprieve from alcohol or alcoholism. Well, to me, the best spiritual, the best maintenance I ever found was to be a spiritual condition. <laughs> Because if I think I have a spiritual condition, that same I will think I don't have one. At any time it wants to. It'll be saying, oh, you're, you're doing great, you're doing great, you're doing great, you're doing great. And no, you're doing terrible. 
Yeah? It's like that game they used to play. You're getting hot, hot, warm, hot, hot, but it, you're not, it, it's not even there. Cold, you're cold, you're cold, hot, hot, warm, come on, hot. It's running the show. It's playing God. It gives distance and space between what you are and what you are. And it tells you how to get there or that you never will. It's playing God. Quit playing God. It doesn't work. What would happen if you, your ba- life wasn't based on thoughts? You would be in I don't know. And that's a weakness. You would be in the great I don't know. You wouldn't have a clue really what's happening and you wouldn't care. Because you'd sense this presence. That's all the authority, that's all the reliability you need is to sense the presence of spirit. When you rely on this, you have to listen to thousands of advertisings, aren't they? Because it's never produced the goods. It's constantly advertised to go against the fact that you know it's unreliable. Constantly promising you, not now, but if you, you know, in, if you follow this five-year plan, you will be happy when you get this, 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 and this. And you go, well, can I have a delivery of happiness now? Oh, no, no, no. This is a layaway. You've got to put an order in first, and then it takes a while to build it up, and then we'll deliver it when you do this and this and this and this. And if you miss one little thing with a lot of fine print, the whole contract is gone. No more happiness, joy, freedom, and you're the blame. If you would have just done that, you would have got it. This is, this is the biggest hoax of all. Yeah? You are that which you're seeking for. So it's a simple recognition. Simple recognition. If you're going to practice anything, if you're not going to practice anything, why not start at the first square? Yeah. I had this thing, I don't know if you ever heard of it, it's like a fungus in your body called candida. Yeah. It's this thing that it, it really screws you up. Yes. And what happens is it kills every other, and so you're supposed to have beneficial flora in you, where a lot of people eat yogurt and they take probiotics and they drink kefir, which is cultured milk to get these beneficial flora in. Now, I was eating this, the highest quality of that stuff for years, yes? And then I went in to have the test, because my stomach was still bothering me. The returns come in. There's no sign of any beneficial flora in your system. I spent tons of effort and money, but I didn't know the real problem. There was a parasite in there that was kicking the ass out of the probiotics and the, and the, uh, and the beneficial parasites. It didn't matter how much I took or the best quality, it was overrided by that parasite that was already there. Yeah? Two years, three years, cost me tons of money, none, not one sign of the beneficial flora in my system. <laughs> That's what it's like. A parasite is in you. If you don't see it as, as it is, which is through the identification as it, whatever you do is going to have diminished returns. It's like you're fighting uphill just to, just to sort of delay the effects of the parasite. Instead of like a full-blown hurricane, you're just going to have bad weather for year after year. Yeah? But as soon as, so now I'm with this lady, and she's just changing the chemistry of my body. I don't have to take anything, anything like this, until that's right. Then start doing some things, and those things will actually work. And their effects will last because they'll, they'll be a... They'll be received, they'll, they'll be have the right Petri dish. Right now, all the good things I was doing was going into a vat of poison. Yeah? The selfing overrode everything I did. So you get 20 sponsees, and then you're selfing about that. Now you think you're a big whatever, kahuna. Or you have too many years and not enough days. You think sobriety is time. I got 25 years but you're not living the principle of freedom at that moment. Who gives a shit about 25 years? And then the people, I love this one, you know, it's great to have, go to a lot of meetings, but then people go, how, what meeting should I attend? I always say this one. Yeah? The one you're at. Attend this one. This is it. Yeah? Be conscious of this. Stop planning your recovery ahead. Why not enjoy it now? That's the point of it. I want freedom. I don't want another way to maintain this unbelievable dilemma, which will override everything anyway. I want that dilemma to be freed. Bye-bye. So that when I do something, it will, it will have lasting benefit, not something that comes and goes at the whim of the parasite. It feeds on relief. 
It feeds on good acts just as it feeds on bad acts. You can get a, a big positive identification of self or a negative one. Gold chains or, or iron chains. But you're still bonded to self. The freedom is freedom from self. It's not freedom for self. If you're identified as self, all our practices is we're trying to get freedom for self. What its idea of freedom isn't the idea we have of freedom. Freedom for self is to have full reign in your life. That's what it is for it. It wants you to be totally comatose. It wants you to be a pliant toast so it can take your life over. Have you seen many alcoholics dying very quickly? They tend to live. They're like the most durable apparatus I've ever seen. The parasite's not going to let go of that one host. You, you're wishing you're dead, and you're still kicking. You're still, I can't believe it. It's the eighth time I've overdosed. I wake up, I'm still alive. The parasite brings you back. It's like Jesus you know, resurrecting the dead. He brings you back. Oh, shit. I'm here again. It won't let you go. It's nasty. <laughs> Do you think it's going to brook any other solution? It, can, it swallows every solution you practice as it. Freedom now just becomes a, a means of being okay, being better later. That's not what freedom is. Freedom isn't a means to be better later. Freedom is now. Freedom is, is, an, is an application now. It's not a hope of it'll be better later. That's a solution that's been taken over by the parasite, regurgitated and given back to the host. Yeah, if you do this, this, and this, and this, and this, you may be better later. No guarantees, but maybe. You know, you hear people, they come in, oh, how are you? Terrible. Well, but they go, I will be okay. What about now? No, 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 no. I'm busy being right about this terribleness, you know. <laughs> how about now? Okay, now? No, I will be okay. Later. How about now? No, 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 no. You don't understand. This is the reality. I'm on okay. But I'm living in the hopes that I will be okay. What a way to travel. But that's what happens. The greatest solution of all, if you drop an alcoholic into heaven, it'll be hell in a day. You can drop an alcoholic in the most idyllic situation and it'll find something wrong in it in about half an hour from the parasite's point of view. Why would you want to try to win that thing over? You know, it says, com admit to your innermost self, you've done that. Stop trying to convince this. This is the dilemma. This is the, uh, this is the disease. It's never going to be convinced. It'll say, oh, I've surrendered, and then it'll take it back a day later. Yeah? It says, oh, I'm thoroughly convinced. I'm serious about this recovery. And then, and then you see him loaded the next day. You don't waste your time with this. This isn't you. You don't have to convince this. You are convinced in your gut. If you just look at the evidence, hopefully not from the eye of the parasite, you will see the writing on the wall. It will be sick and tired is like a stop sign in life. Yeah? It should stop you. It opens up a pause so something can wake up and go, enough's enough. But again, we identify as this, and it's never enough is enough for this. It thrives on bottoms. That's its home. It furnishes it when you're on a bottom. The parasite loves it. It can be in a mansion or in a cell. It doesn't matter. A bottom can be anywhere it is. Wherever it is, there can be a bottom. Because they're synonymous. Really, how many self-help books have you read? Do you ever finish one of them? <laughs> you start like 50 or 80 of them. Or how to be in the moment. That was, that's another bogus thing we bought. How, if you're trying to be in the moment, it must believe you're out of the moment. How can, you are never out of the moment. You're the bringer of this moment. Without consciousness, there wouldn't be a moment. You can't be out of a moment. The head believes it can be out of the moment. Yeah? And then it will tell you how you can get in the moment with no intention of ever bringing you in the moment because you've never been out of the moment to begin with. I don't waste one second listening to this thing. <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm not going to get what I want. Oh, no. <laughs> be worried, Paul. Be worried. Why? 
I can't tell you, but be worried. <laughs> There's some real big impending doom waiting for you. Don't be brazen. Don't live from the truth or you'll be punished. It's like those slasher movies. You ever see slasher movies? The teenager is just going to have sex and then they get stabbed. You know what I mean? What conditioning? You're going to have this natural experience and boom, boom, you get stabbed again. We've been so much... Anxiety has been dumped in us. We can't even embrace something that's so beautiful when it shows up. We have to go over it with thought. The parasite just scurries around it. Finding mistakes and wrongness in it. And then, eh, that's not it. But I wanted some love. No, that's not it. Isn't it? The parasite scurries around whatever you come in contact with. You don't see it. It's called the thinking. Those are its little legs. It's just going thinking. It runs all over something and then it changes and distorts that thing to you. You see love as a threat. Jesus Christ. You see love as a threat. Someone just feels a, a warmness to you and you feel a warmness to them and then let the thinking begin. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Thousands and... Th- yeah, yeah, th- 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 I swear to God, it's amazing we even get a little bit of satisfaction here. I guess it has to... Yes, on the parasite's diet, we'd probably die. So it has to give us a little here and there to keep us going, yeah? So I don't know. I've had an experience of being free of it. Yeah, the experience has been called time in my life for, dur- for a long bit of duration. So I've seen it. I see it works, yeah? It's like an all-terrain vehicle. I travel lighter, no matter what the circumstances and the situations are. When I walk in a room, I walk in the room. I don't think about walking in the room. Or if I, my head thinks about it, I don't listen to those thoughts because they're not about me. I've lost interest in it by the simple reason they're not about me. If you still identify the self, you're going to have a giant wrestling match with your thoughts because you have this huge pull to be totally attentive to them and then you're sick and tired of their results. But you can't seem to break that gravitational feel, pull, you know? Can you? It's difficult. I'm telling you, that gravitational pull hinges on you believing they're about you. That's it. If you entertain they're not about you, you will have immunity to thought. And if you have immunity to thought, you'll be alive. And you'll, and you'll be conscious of being alive. And it feels like something. It feels like something that the parasite can't offer. Because all it offers is an interpretation of life through its eyes. It's, but this is life. Yeah? So you feel that presence. You have a sense of well-being, not based on circumstances or situations. You feel that new power flow in. Like it says on page 63, one of the most beautiful statements in the book, where it says, when you get established in this position of relying on something greater than self, to me, calling it me is established in it. The best establishment I could ever have on that is to realize it's me. So when I'm established in that power that's greater than self, all these things happen. I have a new power flows in. I feel some juice. It's called presence, aliveness. I learn I can face life successfully. I always like to use this one because this is how it happened to me in AA, this example of facing life successfully. I remember that I went to my first AA dance, which became my last AA dance. I I went to my first AA dance in my first year, and I was on the men's side. It was like a room like this, but with disco balls in them. And the men were on one side, and the women were on the other side. And never the two shall meet, you know what I mean? We're there. And everyone had their calistogas or whatever <laughs> for defense. Instead of, we didn't have beer or anything. We were drinking. I must have had a giant carbonate bubble. I must have drank about eight of them, worried, you know, concerned. And then I became like a you know, elected to be the scout. I was going to go to the other side to the women and ask one of them to dance, to break the ice, you know, because no one had danced for 40-something minutes. The dance, you know, the DJs were playing. No one had entered the field. So I went over there, feeling very self-conscious, obviously. And I went over to a girl I liked. And I had a, you know, it felt like natural. I don't know if I can know what natural is after being taken over so long, but it felt like I had a natural liking for that woman. And I asked her, I went up to ask her to dance. And she said, no. <laughs> now, this is what was impending doom to me all my life, the fear of rejection. It made me become very small in life because to protect me from that fear of rejection, I didn't ask for much. You know, I was vindictive and envious of people and tried to break them down 
you know, present them because I didn't have the balls to go for anything because I was afraid what would it mean about me if I failed. So there I was, and the whole I felt like my ego shrunk like a prune, you know, like a raisin. Oh, it's really pa- t- very painful. And then I just I turned around. I, and now that no man's land between the men and the women was like a landmine field, yeah. And the disco ball was like a spotlight on me. And I was coming back to my troop with no scalp, so to speak. And I was walking back there with my Calistoga. And but I was experiencing life successfully. The rejection didn't kill me. Yeah? And when I got back to the men's side, I didn't have to berate her. I really liked her. I wanted to dance with her. I didn't say, oh, I didn't want to dance with her. Oh, she wasn't anything special. You know how the mind makes up its little rationales and excuses? But I, I didn't go with that. I just sat there. I, yeah, I really wanted to, her to dance. And I wanted to, her to like me. And obviously, she doesn't want to dance with me. And that fear of rejection was, because the real fear was that it would kill me. And it didn't kill anything. It may have hurt the parasite, but it didn't kill me at all. Actually, I thrived after that night. Yeah? So I learned I could face life successfully in this world of AA. Then I felt the greatest thing. I felt the conscious presence of what we call the higher power. Because I wasn't so preoccupied with selfing, I could sense the emanation of spirit. That is you. It's some, you feel it as a presence. Yeah, I sense that presence. Thank you. Welcome. I sense that presence. Then it says, after all this happens, you'll see that you can outgrow fear of today, tomorrow, and the hereafter. You will actually be reborn, or I believe, to be undone from the parasite and wake up to your true nature. But they call it rebirth in a sense. So, and in that waking up to the nature is how I outgrow fear. Yeah, today, tomorrow, and hereafter. Not as a self. I have to leave that occupation, and in that, my natural state is not to be occupied by fear. My natural state is to be in faith, in a sense, which is, to me, an, an ease and comfort in my skin now. That's what faith is. It's not about getting a parking space next week at the meeting, but faith is that ease and comfort now. And I truly believe everyone in this room has tons of faith. Every one of us, we have tons of faith. It's What happens in this place is faith manifests based on the vehicle you have it in. If you rely on what's unreliable, that faith is going to be turned into anxiety. And that's, hasn't it happened? When you're relying on self, which is unreliable, your faith in self turns into anxiety in your life. <laughs> it's incredible. Now, when you have faith in this higher power, it stays just as that. You get an ease and comfort in your own skin. Past and future become less important than now because this is what's happening. A lot of things that were confusing get cleared up. You can see blue is blue and red is red because you're awake. You're awake. You're not seeing through the haze the parasite creates. You're awake now. Yes? That's the freedom. And then you live it because you are it. How could you not live it? You've been living in its denial for a long time. Now you're living in its... uh, Recognition, that's all. And then, just like you were an expression of the parasite, you'll be an expression of this power. Yeah, so like people come in, they go, tell you like the worst thing that ever happened to them. And then they were in AA for two years, and now it's the best thing that ever happened to them. What an incredible contrast, isn't it? From the parasitical's point of view, that was the worst thing that ever happened. When that point of view is lifted, it's seen as the best thing that ever happened. The same event. Just watch reading it, yeah? The same life that you think sucks, that you were, had no value in when you come in AA, that thing that you would, like to me, AA is the greatest recycling plant, really. Because for me, I felt for years out there I had no value. Everything I did had absolutely no value. I was just taking and running and doing this, hurting people. Yet when I surrendered that, life took, AA took it and it became my story. And it's been used at, you know, work with thousands of people in the AA. It's amazing, isn't it? It's freaking amazing the power that we've been that we we have been presented, but it's what's trying to receive it may dim its effects. Yes, I'm not saying I'm not here to change anything. I just wanted to add on to something. I wanted to add on that maybe it's an act of identification, and if you are identified as it, you won't know it. Yeah, you probably will have to hear it from out some outside source, or you may get a lightning bolt. But most people I know don't get the lightning bolt but they do hear it from an outside source. 
you know, someone offers them this message and then it resonates in them and then now they're on their way to freedom from the bondage of self. Yeah? One tentacle gets lifted, another, another. You <laughs> keep getting free samples of life without parasite or without that bondage and your nature and your what you are loves the freedom from that. It loves it. And then you know better. You're not going to go back there. You have wisdom about your own thoughts now. Just like you can pontificate to a sponsee, you can actually hold that yourself. It's very clear. See, I'm serious, man. You're freed. You're freed. And isn't that the point? Well, to me it is, anyway. I mean, I t- hasn't that occupation been unbelievable? Have you taken over by that thing? You know, even if you want something, it, you can't even enjoy it when you get it. It just keeps you... You can't even... You take love as a threat. It's mind-boggling. You, you take peace as a, a product that you have to achieve when it's your natural state. You take love as some commodity you have to get out there when you're the source of love. Can you imagine living an interpretation of a whole life of being unloved when you're the source of love the whole time? You know, you don't think you're a miracle worker? Look at what you've done. The parasite has made what's not happening seem more important or more real than what's happening. You, if, if that's not a miracle. I don't know what is. And the power it's used to do that is yours. Your potential is what the parasite craves because the parasite can make a life seem to be its own with your life. So it lives in what's not happening and it dumps all the what's not happening into the what's happening and it clouds up the what's happening so you don't even know anymore what's happening. You can't move. You can't. You don't even know what an honest feeling is anymore. You have a feeling that wants to move towards something. You're like, you have to think about it. It's insane, man happened to us. We've been taken over. It's time to be free, eh? So they say self-knowledge avails us nothing in AA. The the way the selfing works, though, is by claiming and by owning and by having. So any knowledge that you receive and you're identified as self, the self will claim that knowledge and it will avail you nothing because it won't lead you to freedom from self. You'll just know more about self. Yeah? sort of like becoming a professor of holes, but you're still falling into holes. What's the point of that knowledge? You want to stop from falling into holes. Yeah? But knowledge is incredible, if not claimed by self. That's what I do here. I try to describe and make metaphorical pictures of what selfing looks like so that you can identify with it and then give you a solution to it by saying you're not that and then hopefully sitting in the certainty of that solution. So that energetically we can feel it, yes? Because there's an energy in this room, and I'm feeding on it, and you're feeding on it what you are. It's like manna from heaven. You may not know it, but there's some juice going on. And I live, thrive on that juice, because it reinforces the certainty of what I'm not and what I am. Yeah? So... I've never missed one meeting that I've done. <laughs> Seriously, I've been doing it for 18 years. I never missed one. I need it the most, obviously. i got to keep listening to it. I listen to it just like maybe hopefully you're listening to it. It's not like I'm sitting here thinking anything. No, I'm listening to this energy trying to express itself through language because it's beautiful to me. Because the language, and as it's moving through me, it intimates its nature to me. Not to me, but itself. I feel it. I feel it. I intimate the beauty and love of it. Yeah? And, uh... It's just like, yeah. (laughs) So... And then again, I have the memory of hell. know what's taking you over 
and I know its capacity to make hell. And I, uh, man, I'd love to see that not happen to you. Even a hell in recovery. You know? so. so I'll have to gather myself together. <laughs> questions. There's no self to gather. <laughs> I hope you gathered that. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah? Yeah? Yes? You have a question? Someone? Yeah? You know, uh, man, it's a lot. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, you turned the on switch. Yeah. Yeah, you definitely did. Um, you know, like, what you said about when you seen your uncle that wasn't him, and walking into the door, coming in here, how, my perception was, it's, it's like, I'm so caught up in projecting that I can't enjoy the moment. That's right. Of coming in this room, and coming in this room. That's not right. coming in this room, wondering what someone thinks, oh, look at you got on, this is a, this is a, you know, actually, in, being in the moment, you know, uh, I mean, you, you just, I mean, it's so much. Um, um, when you talk of uh, 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 I am it, like you know, I, th- I am the spirit, you know, like like how how could I not be here? I'm here. That's right. And when the parasites take over, when the parasites, as we use the word parasites, uh, take over, or uh, we call the disease of alcoholism, you know, uh, it it's it, it. What I wanted to ask you. Knowing the world that it is, that this is what basically the world of commercials and all that stuff that bit, that have affected us, like you said, two and three and four years old, this is when you was more pure than anything, and I can agree with that, because you didn't have all that noise. That's right. That noise didn't, uh, 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 I say, corrupt or uh, uh, infiltrate our mind, you yeah. know, poison our mind, where now I can actually, as a kid, enjoy playing with that G.R. Joe. Or oh, enjoy playing with the, you know, because I'm right here in the moment. Yeah. As I grow, I, 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 I get the poison. I get the, you know, that self. Yeah. And that self, that self uh, not allowing me to uh, uh, feel my, my self being of spirit, my spirit. Yes. It, it's, it's, it, at first I thought it was just playing with words. This guy's playing on words because it's back self of, of the spirit. But I, I, I really got it. I can't really explain the way you just did, but I really understood everything you said, because uh, it's almost like a, a <laughs> interference, a radio wave that's interfering with me being who, being the spirit that I'm supposed to be, the natural person I am. That's and right. these radio waves is constantly uh, 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 distorting the information that comes to me. Yes. And then when I put that information back out, it's actually, my reality is the perspective of what I see. But that's not really seeing that. That's right. It's an awesome, I, 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 I really enjoyed this. That was well put, yeah. yeah. That's what's happening, yeah. Thanks for qualifying, Rick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. uh, Rick mentioned uh, what you said about Uncle Fred. You recognize Uncle Fred, and then you saw him in a the casket. They need to rec- uh, recognize him. I missed that. Oh, well, Uncle Fred... My Uncle Fred, I liked, he had played a role in my life, and then he died, and when they brought me by the casket, I looked in, and I had a very strong hit that that ain't Uncle Fred. There was the body that I was calling Uncle Fred, but the animating principle, a spirit had left. And without that spirit, it wasn't Uncle Fred. And the reason why I saw him as a body, because I was seeing from, as myself as a body. Yeah? In other words, the conditioning was already in place, so I see you as a body because I see myself as a body. When I don't see myself as a body, I can sense the spirit that you are. It's clean. Yeah. Yes? You know, I, I thank you. For, uh, I, I, uh, I really got a lot of what you were saying. I don't get to, you know, I can do an aid or something like to qualify. It's a little bit of a twist on, I guess, the program of recovery and uh, the aspect of going a little bit on the a level, and I understood you. Uh, and the joke that I would say, you know, you have to be, you have to be present to be in the present, you know. And this guy, 85 years old, he gets up to Harvard and Goldberg. You know what happens? How can you be present? 
she hits her and so he goes, Bakar, uh, I'm 85 years old. I lived a long time. He goes, two months. He goes, what happened? He goes, I'm 85. Oh, he goes, yeah, but you're only in there now two months. Well, they were telling me when that thing, you know, <laughs> you know yeah, yeah. you're in the future. He said, yeah. you weren't really private. Yeah. You know, so I get that. I get that, you know, you walking towards the dance floor, the fear of someone saying, no, yeah, I didn't like the right. Well, yeah, of course not. Yeah. I didn't like yeah. it because this is all what this, this, this thing, this self, does for us. Because I do believe, and I love to watch children playing. I have no children, and I don't think God met me to because my patience levels were low. Well. <laughs> but I have nieces and nephews, and I can give them back to their mothers. And uh, I see them playing, and I enjoy most of all the three-year-old nephew and, and another nephew that's like older. But I used to watch them play all the time. And and they would be so like, they're not worried about the guests. Not worried about the electrical, and not worried about who's paying the rent, and they're so in the moment. And I would just look at them and say, "Wow, that is so phenomenal." And I get that, you know, when I go to funerals, that, you know, I say to people a lot of times when they're complaining, you know, and they're afraid, and my aunt's got cancer, and, so, and I'm like, "But we're not, we're not from here. We don't come from here." You know, I get that we don't come from here. I get that we're not here. And being through a program of recovery. And being in a fellowship for a long time, and then being in a program of recovery, and, and not experiencing both sides of the coin, you know, I, I think of the Dalai Lama, I think of a lot, of, a lot of different things. The connection to self, the connection to, well not self, but the connection to the spirit, the truth, the person. You know, I know in prayer and meditation that I'm able to get to the real, get all the other shit out. When I'm meditating, I'm kind of spending time with that universal power, that power that I originated from. And a lot of times, you know, for me, like if I disconnect for a few days, I will go a little off. And there's times that I will not go a little off because there's times that I already know that I'm good and I'm from that spirit and that's who I am. I'm not from here. And there's other times that that parasite gets in. And, and I forget that I'm not from here, and I'm back in this material world. So the biggest question I have to you is how the hell do you keep it turned off? How do you keep that parasite out? First of all, I don't keep it turned off. I just, well, I, just I have a recognition it's not me. So how do you get there? You don't get there. You're there already. The recognition of not of it's not me is already how do there. I recognize it? How do I... How well, you you may be looking to recognize it. Well, you may be trying to recognize it as a, as the self. That's the dilemma. Yeah. yeah. Well, whatever it is, how do we how do we get turned on? Well, just entertaining never was turned on. So continue to remind yourself this is not even me. Well, if that what you need to take, I would what I would suggest is use maybe a subjective question. It's a very nice way to go. If you want to do something like that, if you want to have like a like a, a formalized pause, use the question, who am I? So let's say the head is thinking it was disconnected for a few days, right? You, the head tells you, I feel like I've been disconnected for a few days. Why don't you ask who that is? That felt like it was disconnected for a few days. So who is who am I? Who is it that felt like it was disconnected? Then the head may say something, and then they ask, who is it that just said that? And what you'll find is it'll be interesting. Try it. I never got there. I have no idea where I am. <laughs> Seriously. I have no freaking you're just, idea. You're good with being just here, and that's it. And, and you can well, I can't be anywhere else. <laughs> so. Well, I don't know if that rolls off. They're there or the back. No, seriously. I can't be anywhere else. That's the recognition. I cannot. What I am cannot be anywhere else than where I am. Yeah? To me, the past, if it was supposed to happen, it did. If it didn't, it wasn't supposed to happen. End of story. Yeah. I can plan about the future, but I don't believe in one. Because the future, I, the planning for the future is now. Yeah. Everything that I do, if I'm thinking about the future, or if my head's thinking about the future, it's happening now. Nothing escapes the reality of now. We just think it does. And what thinks it does is selfing to me. When you realize you're not that, you won't think it does anymore on a deeper level than thought. You'll realize that all there is, I mean realize that all there is is what's happening, and that's that. And therefore you'll hunker down in it, 
because that's a natural response. When you see that there's no options to be somewhere else or doing this or doing that, you tend to find yourself where you are. <laughs> and then you go, what? Well, here I am. And then it becomes a habit. You don't have to say anything. It's just recognition. Being in the now, I know the importance of it because when I'm not in the now, it's true. But you can see the thing, I'm, what I'm sharing is, this is the idea I'm sharing, is that you cannot not be in the now. See, your head has an idea of the now. Your head has an idea of what the now is and what it isn't. But both of those are the now. You cannot be out of the now. No matter how much your head says you are, you're not. See? Relying on the self, you believe you can be out of the now. So if you believe you can be out of the now, who's going to do something to get into the now? You! That's playing God. You are the now. You can't get out of it, and therefore there's no need to get in it. Whammo! It's as obvious as, like, right in your face. There's nothing you can do about it. You can think your way, you can do whatever you, your head can do whatever it can. It doesn't change one bit of the fact that you are, you are the now. Not that you're in it. You are the now. Without you, there ain't no now. Without the spirit you are, there is no now for you to be in or out. That's the thing. It just gets, <laughs> there's a recognition that's available because you are it. Yes? Your head will not entertain it. Your head will entertain it to an antidote to itself. So you use self-questioning. So you're using parasite to talk to parasite. Right? But the message isn't the parasite goes, oh yes, now I'm not the parasite. What happens is the parasite and the parasite get tired, the activity, and then what's always so, the background becomes the foreground. The foreground of all the parasitic activity becomes the background. And it's just as obvious why do I have to ever try to get into the moment? I can't be out of it. Yes? <laughs> I mean, literally. It's incessantly on. It never. There's no connection-disconnection. Awareness doesn't blink. It doesn't take a breath. There's no beginning to it, and there's no end. There's no access point, because it's always accessible, because it never began or ended. There's not one door. Everything's a door of it. It's awareness. It's all there is. You're plopped in the middle of it. It doesn't begin when you go, oh, I'm ready to feel awareness. It's prior to that. It's prior to you thinking you've got to get ready. It's already so. When you go, okay, no, nope, it was there already. It's so blatantly obvious you don't recognize it. It's like the fish in the water. The fish can see everything in the water but the water itself. The sense of nowness is the water. You're appearing as a fish in it, but you're actually the water. You are that nowness. Yeah. I'm, I want ice. Oh, I'm yeah. Pass the basket for Paul. He has a lot of expenses. Came <laughs> <laughs> a long way. Give if you like. If not, that's okay too. Yeah. Any other questions? I have one here. Look, I, I gotta, I gotta go move my car. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is. is 